Hello. <laughs> Welcome. Um, so my name is Greg Stewart. I'm, the, I'm in the Public Programs Department here at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, I'm so happy to welcome you to the Irma and Herbert Barnes uh, Endowed Lecture on the topic of the city beautiful. Um, so this is the third in our three-part lecture series on the topic of beauty. Um, we're definitely thinking of museums, art museums in particular, as places that really uh, celebrate uh, beauty in all of its forms. Um, but we're also really interested in kind of picking the definition of that word apart, thinking about it critically and expanding it with this um, lecture series. So it's in that spirit today um, that our topic addresses the City Beautiful movement, which is an urban planning movement um, roughly from around the turn of the 20th century um, that has deep connections to uh, Philly and particularly the parkway if you look to your left, which we are adjacent to. Sorry, I feel like I'm on an airplane. Um, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> anyway. Um, we wanted to use this movement kind of as an anchor for our talk today, um, but then we want to open up this conversation, not only talking about cities of the past, but also of the present and, and future. And I think this leads us to this really super huge question when we talk about what makes a city beautiful, um, which is who decides what cities look like and for whom are they designed? Um, so Michelle uh, Miller-Fisher, the Louise and C. Madiera IV Assistant Curator of European Decorative Arts, um, is really the one who brought us this topic, and we're so excited. Um, and it's in advance of an upcoming exhibition opening this November uh, titled Design for Different Futures that we're sort of thinking about this right now. Um, she's going to start by giving us an overview of the uh, City Beautiful movement from a design perspective. Um, then we'll hear uh, to her right, we'll hear from Diane Harris, um, on her research into the history of Levittown, which also you know, certainly has those deep PA roots again. Um, Diane uh, is a senior program officer at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, where she focuses on higher education and scholarship in the humanities. Um, she holds a PhD in architectural history from the University of California, Berkeley, and is the author of numerous scholarly articles and award-winning books that are united by a constant interest in the relationship between the built environment and the construction of race and class identities, racial and class identities. Um, in October of 2016, Diane was nominated by President Barack Obama to serve on the National Council on the Humanities. Um, next, we have Professor Daniel Wood, uh, who serves as assistant professor in the uh, program in uh, media arts and sciences within the Media Lab at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, within the Media Lab, Professor Wood leads the Space Enabled Research Group. Um, which seeks to advance justice in Earth's complex systems using designs enabled by space. Um, and it's really this work that um, Danielle will be focusing on today. Um, she's a scholar of social development or societal development with a background that includes satellite design, Earth science applications, systems engineering, and technology policy. And she holds a PhD in engineering systems. Um, then we'll hear from Nolan Ryan Tro, uh, who will be talking about city design and kind of navigating urban space spaces with a disability. Um, originally from California, um, Nolan Ryan Tro is a documentary photographer and writer based out of Brooklyn, New York, who has primarily focused on disability rights um, and representation. Nolan suffered a spinal cord injury at the T12 level and was diagnosed with paraplegia on June 21st, 2016. Um, one year after becoming disabled, he moved to California, or from California to New York, to pursue his MA in exper uh, Experimental Humanities and Social Engagement at NYU, where he has focused on human rights and photojournalism. His work has appeared in the New York Times and other major publications. Um, so after these presentations, uh, Michelle Fisher is going to jump back on the mic for a kind of moderated Q&A with our uh, speakers, and will be joined by Dylan uh, Garner, who is the creative director of Cohere, um, a creative agency dedicated to building better cities through um, placemaking branding. Uh, Dylan is also the co-founder of the Philly chapter of Ladies Wine and Design, um, a salon style program um, encouraging rich conversations about the design field um, from female and female identifying designers. Um, Ladies Wine and Dine is a uh, or wine and design, excuse me, is a co-presenter of this program, and we want to kind of give them a shout out. Many of whom uh, are here in the audience today. Um, and uh, so while we're in the subject of shout outs, I just wanted to express um, how hugely grateful we are uh, to the Barnes family for their generous support of this program, um, which has really provided us so many opportunities from, 
for these kind of rich conversations, and we're so grateful for that. Um, and so after we have that sort of moderated Q&A, uh, we'll open it up to Q&A from you, um, and after which we'll adjourn to um, cafe, the cafe next door for a uh, reception with some snacks and also wine for purchase, because of course, if ladies wine design here, we'd better have wine. Um, and so uh, that's it for me. I'll let Michelle start us off. Thank you so much, Greg. How is everyone today? Good, it's lovely to see you here. Um, I wanted to say a huge thank you to Greg, to Emily, to Marla, to colleagues in education. Every time we do a program together, it's such a collaboration from the conceptual moment to delivering it. Um, and so it's such a wonderful thing to be able to collaborate in this way. Thank you so much to them. Thank you again. I want to echo the thanks to uh, the Bonas family for having us as part of the endowed lecture series, to Dylan and Ladies Wine and Design for being here, and particularly to our three amazing speakers whose expertise is fantastic. I'm so delighted that you're with us. Um, and I'm going to keep my remarks very short that, uh, so that we can get you uh, up here at the podium. So today we're coming together to talk about beautiful future cities um, and what cities of the future will look like and who will shape them. Our speakers are going to reflect on their own areas of deep research, and I've sat them really badly in, in, in a really badly designed way here, actually. Well, we can talk about bad design uh, later on in our Q&A uh, so that you can uh, see the slides. If you need to move your chairs, please do. Um, but our speakers today are going to reflect on their own areas of deep research, and they're going to help us look at the past, present, and the future. How can we learn from the ways in which we've shaped cities and their surrounds in the last centuries to make better choices in the next? How might space-enabled technologies pave the way for cities on and off Earth in the future, and to what impact? And how might we rethink our relationships with the infrastructures of the city to create a more inclusive and accessible space for all? The conversation is meant to be warm, open, engaging, and inclusive of the perspectives, not only on stage, but of the audience too. So I really encourage you during the Q&A to speak up and to bring your experiences to bear. And as you'll see from the very brief slides that I've put together that are non-exhaustive and not comprehensive, it's a very large topic. So we're not going to get to absolutely everything today, although I hope the conversation will continue over refreshments. We're adding to an already very live debate, a discussion that's been going on for decades, if not centuries. Although hopefully we'll learn something from each other and from the exchange today. I'm going to sketch out some of its broadest parameters before handing over to uh, Diane, Danielle, and Nolan. So the program this afternoon came out of a conversation about a year ago when I was chatting with Emily, Greg, and uh, Jenny Drozdek, actually, our other colleague in education. And it was tied, as Greg said, to an exhibition that's coming up this fall called Designs for Different Futures, which is another deeply collaborative project here at the museum. When Emily told me that the theme of this year's uh, lecture series was beauty, I asked if we could create a conversation around the ways in which we might shape future cities. Ever since the Industrial Revolution kicked into gear a couple of centuries ago and has been um, experienced uh, and manifested in different ways and at different times, populations have migrated to cities to live and to work. Um, in 2016, it was about 55% of the global population that lived in an urban settlement. And by 2030, urban areas are projected to house over 60% of people globally. One in every three of us at that time is projected to live in a city with at least half a million inhabitants. So it's a no-brainer. Cities are going to be important not only now but in our futures in determining health and well-being, uh, economies and societies. And they're also, as a design curator, I'm deeply interested in them. They're a major focus focus of design, of urban planning, of architecture, and of social policy and community activism. In our upcoming exhibition, we're going to use contemporary design to catalyze discussion about different possible futures that are multiple, contingent, and socially located, and cities are very much part of this discussion. And so you can see the slide uh, that I have up just here. These are two of the objects or projects that if you come to the museum in October, we open to the public October 22nd, um, you'll see each of them in the galleries over in the uh, main building. On the left just here, London Architects, a Finnish firm, have created these absolutely beautiful large pods filled with air and water. You can see the scale of them. The largest is about 12 feet in diameter. 
And you see the sensors that go up to the ceiling. Um, they respond to carbon monoxide around them in their immediate environment. So as visitors come close to them, they expand and contract as they um, feel the breathing that's happening, or they register the breathing that's happening around them, um, which is meant to be a meditation on the connection between uh, humans and their immediate environment. And then on the right, the woven wool map of the buildings inside the El Ayon refugee camp in southwest Algeria, one of several camps where the people of the Western Sahara have been living for over 40 years displaced from their home by conflict. The map shows their self-determination in the face of displacement, a city with centralized self-government that provides health and education services to its people across hundreds of miles. The exhibition is also going to look at infrastructure through projects like Hyperloop and a large dome, driverless vision, that shows the cityscape um, in Korea from the perspective of an autonomous vehicle. The examples are necessary, necessarily selective because we only have so much gallery space, and they range very widely, but they all gesture to a perennial age-old question, how do we and how could we shape the places in which we live? The intersection of the city and the idea of beauty has historical roots, of course. The trope of the city beautiful is over 100 years old, beginning as a reform philosophy in architecture and urban planning in North America that flourished at the end of the 19th century and into the early 20th, with the intent of intru introducing beautification and monumental grandeur in cities in response to things like crowding in tenements, uh, immigration, and internal migration of rural populations into cities. Architect Daniel Burnham introduced it perhaps first with his White City at the World's Columbia Exposition in 1893, which you see just to the left here. Um, it proposed new modern transport, Beaux-Arts style buildings, um, an end to poverty, a bright utopia, or perhaps a whitewashed fantasy. Philadelphia became part of this conversation with the plans for the Benjamin Franklin Parkway, which as Greg noted was sitting just beside. Um, and I have a copy of um, David Brownlee's book actually up on the table if you want to, thank you so much, Diane. If you want to come up and take a look afterwards, if you haven't seen it, it's a really wonderful um, meditation on Philly's part in this history written by our eminent uh, friend at UPenn. And this conversation certainly wasn't new. Um, I'm British, so I'm gonna add in a British architect too. Um, Augustus Welby Northmore Pugin had pondered this topic in the 1840s, a little bit earlier than the City Beautiful movement, and it was in the same vein, a, a reaction to the Industrial Revolution. As people poured into cities to work in new factories and commercial sectors, Pugin wrote Contrast in 1836, and he contrasted the medieval city of the 1440s, which you can see above, with the city that he occupied in the 1840s. And so what he longed for in this medieval paradise, which he saw not only as more beautiful, but more ethically and spiritually um, clean in a way, uh, was church steeples proliferating, green space proliferating, and then in the 1840s, the factory chimney taking over and the workhouse architecture taking over the uh, landscape in the foreground. Pugin's contrast were fictions, but very much based in a reality as he saw it. But I think it's important for us to remember that architects and designers have long used their untrammeled imaginations as design tools to create unbuilt but very provocative ideas that remain in the collective consciousness and shape future experimentation, sometimes for better and sometimes for worse. Sometimes they're intended to remain in the realm of fantasy, much like what you see here. Architect, Italian architect Piranesi sketches, uh, Super Studios, radical Italian monuments of the um, 1960s, or 20th century Swiss-French architect Le Corbusier's Radiant City to the right, something that he never got to build but uh, did his damnedest to try during his lifetime in the mid-20th century. And these imaginary spaces are the stuff of popular culture too, of sci-fi, of literature, of film. Who could forget the very evocative landscapes of Blade Runner, for example, on the left-hand side? And then on the right is another work from the upcoming Design Futures show by uh, Lech Jafus and Wale Lawal, a part of a series that they made on what the future of uh, Lagos, Nigeria might look like in 100 years from now. And of course, today we're going to think about the ways in which what happens off Earth might shape the future of how we will live here and in space, something that Danielle is going to take us uh, closer to, from access to satellites to communities on Mars. And this is a rendering by Foster and Partners. 
Writers like Ace Ratcliffe challenge us to think about these types of futures in the most expansive and inclusive of ways, asking in this article, for example, why, when we think of communities off Earth, we still include deeply inaccessible architecture and design that often ignores or erases disability. As she puts it, and I'm going to quote from her, Space, as we all know, is the final frontier. It's the star-spangled playground in which our imaginations run amok and the setting for stories that make us fall in love with sci-fi. So why the hell are there so many staircases in space? Danielle's work similarly has challenged us to move beyond the idea of colonizing outer space. Why choose vocabulary that immediately calls to mind asymmetries of power? Why wouldn't we want to change this mentality now and in the future when we design? While there's a history of imagining new cities and housing or looking to the future, the actions of architects and designers as well as city planners and administrators and politicians and really citizens of all types have very real consequences on our cities today and the here and now. And of course, it's also the past that informs the ways in which we imagine different possible futures. And that's something that Diane's going to bring us closer to. There are so many stories that might be told here, and Diane's going to bring some of them to, to light in the eight minutes that she has in a very elegant essay, I have to say. It's, it's fantastic. Um, but I felt I could uh, touch on Pruitt Igo because it's one that she is not covering. Um, and it's one for, I think, many of us we find emblematic of the last 100 years, um, uh, the Pruitt Igo complex in St. Louis, in St. Louis Missouri. Um, many of you will know it, perhaps if you don't. It was built by Minoru Yamasaki, who's the same architect as that of the Twin Towers. Um, and at its uh, founding, as it, when it was built in the 1950s, it was seen as this sort of beacon for modern new housing that could fulfill the post-war needs in growing cities like St. Louis. Um, it then became very quickly emblematic of um, neglect and bad maintenance, and also um, White, white flight, uh, governmentally backed mortgages that were discriminatory really in practice and encouraged um, many to move to the suburb, suburbs and many of whom were white. Um, and so in this image here, you see it being detonated and bombed down in 19, uh, 1972, 20 years after its founding. And so when we think about who tells the stories of cities past, present, and future, Pruitt-Igoe, I think, is actually a really interesting um, example, again, especially for its recent history. I don't know how many of you have seen the Pruitt-Igoe myth, a great documentary that really foregrounds um, a, sort of a, a new architectural history of the past couple of decades and lets, audience, uh, lets residents of these uh, let's residents of these spaces um, speak about their experiences rather than seeing it from the point of view of out outsiders. Thank you. It was like uh, oasis in the desert, all this newness. I never thought I would live in that kind of a surrounding. What happened? Well, one day you woke up and it was all gone. So. <laughs> And so every one of the voices in the film that you saw was a longtime inhabitant of the Pruitt Igo homes. And so it's often the citizens um, of a city who do the work of speaking honestly about it, what, what it means to live there, and who organize about how we might plan forward. In Philadelphia, this is the work of grassroots projects that engage with the future of cities, like the People's Platform for a Just Philadelphia, who's having a meeting tomorrow, if anyone's interested. Um, it's Googleable. Philly's Women-Led Cities Initiative that bring women's voices to the forefront of urban planning and design, and indeed the recent PMA exhibition, Philadelphia Assembled. These projects and many, many others like them across many different cities look at social, social structures as infrastructure, asking questions about how incarceration, universal basic income, access to food and education and housing and more shape cities and how we might work for more equitable access in the future. And so we can't cover every aspect of this, um, at least in our presentations and Q&A on stage, but I encourage a free-for-all when we get to the Q&A and we can do our best between the shared expertises in the audience and on stage to have some discussions around these ideas. Um, for now, I'm really honored to pass on the baton to our three speakers today who will talk very specifically about their stake in the conversation. And I look forward to the conversation indeed that follows. Um, if you can join me in welcoming very warmly Diane to the stage. Thank you. Thank you 
so much. Can you all hear me? Yeah? yeah. Yes. Loud. I'll be loud. Okay. Yes? Okay. So, um, first of all, thank you so much to Michelle and Greg and the staff here at the museum for, uh, in, for putting this together and for inviting me and for making the space to have this great conversation. Um, and it seems especially perfect to have this conversation today when I saw for the first time here in Philadelphia, we aren't seeing them yet in New York, um, some things blooming. And so thinking about future cities, I think, um, is inherently, for me, I hope, for all of you, a hopeful act. And seeing those things blooming, it seems, is just, just fitting for what we're going to talk about today. So starting with this question of who decides what future cities look like? How have ideas about beauty intersected with utopian visions of model cities and with our ideas about residential perfection and about who has the right to such idealized spaces? Whoops, wrong way. There we go. So as a historian, I'm not much good at thinking about the future. Um, so I'm going to talk instead about the reasonably recent past and about a place that's located just about 30 miles or so away from here that I happen to know quite well because, and here's my um, shameless promotion, I edited and, and authored two essays in the books wh whose cover you see here about Levittown, Pennsylvania. Um, is anybody here in the room from Levittown or has lived in since Levittown, Pennsylvania? Oh, good. Oh, good. Okay. Awesome. Hello. <laughs> Good. All right. So um, this Levittown in Pennsylvania, as many of you know, was the second of the eponymously named suburbs um, built between 1951 and 1957 on former farmland here in Philadelphia. So that's the context. There are many Levittowns. The first was in Long Island. This was the second. As a scholar who studies the history of suburbia and ordinary post-war houses in the United States, I've had an enduring fascination with places like Levittown places that promise so much, and for some have delivered so much, like personal and family security, the ability to accumulate wealth through property ownership, the ability to create intergenerational wealth through property inheritance, the ability to access good public schools, fresh air, healthy and affordable food, decent medical care, in short, all the things that the scholar George Lipsitz has called access to life chances that result in improved economic stability, political enfranchisement, and a slice of the oft-mentioned American dream. Suburbs like Levittown might be seen as exemplars of that dream, and they were in fact touted as such by the housing and other industries during the Second World War and beyond. But here's the thing. Suburbs like Levittown never really fulfilled that promise for everyone, and, and the majority of post-war suburbs were not intended for all, but were instead designed to be primarily for whites. In the Jim Crow North, Levittown existed like so many other new developments did nationwide, as they had for decades prior, and as many still do today, as islands of racially segregated privilege. More on that in just a minute. American planners, uh, oh, and here's a, a nice aerial photograph for you of Levittown, Pennsylvania from about 1953 when it was first getting built out. Um, and some nice Jubilee models that you can see here um, that show you what the town looked like when it was uh, first built and then uh, an image from about 2006. And this idea that Levittown was indeed a perfectly planned community, right? That it, that it was advertised this way, that it was absolutely perfect. Well, in 1868, uh, uh, I'm sorry, so, so I just want to say that American planners and designers have had a lot of ideas about beautiful future cities over the decades. But if we step back for a minute, which is literally all I have uh, time this afternoon to do with this complicated uh, history of suburbia, and look at some earlier roots of the leafy, beautiful, picturesque suburb, we might be able to see the ways that, as, that that aesthetic has been predicated on a racially monochromatic vision. In 1868 to 69, Frederick Law Olmsted, who was already by then acclaimed for having created New York Central Park with his partner Calvert Vox, designed Riverside, Illinois, what many historians have pointed to as the first planned American suburb. Located about uh, 10 miles from the center of downtown Chicago and accessible via a recently completed railroad line, Riverside was designed as a world apart a well-to-do residential world for Chicago businessmen who could make their wealth in the city while keeping their families out of the dirty, dusted, dusty, I'm not sure what that was, I don't know. 
uh, the dirty, dusty, uh, cr and here you see another view of Riverside with these houses set back from the street, but this is what they're reacting against, this dirty, dusty, crowded, often dangerous, and increasingly ethnically and racially diverse urban, urban very crowded urban density uh, that, they, that they were kind of worried about. Riverside's curvilinear streets with single-family houses set well back from the street on spacious lots that were marked by an abundance of mature oak and hickory trees set in verdant lawns became an early model for the ideal American suburb. The aesthetic standard, the beauty ideal here, was based in spaciousness, residential privacy, access to the green spaces of private yards and public parks, but it was also based in residential segregation. Riverside's residents remain, even today, 95% white. So from about 1868 onwards, when Olmsted designed Riverside, the idea of the picturesque suburb began to dominate American ideas about what the ideal residential setting should look like. And it wasn't urban, it wasn't dense, it wasn't for multifamily living, and it wasn't for everyone. It was primarily, overwhelmingly, for white folks, and explicitly so, written into restrictive covenants and built into a range of structures in the lending and real estate industries that kept it so, and kept it so for decades. Sorry. The City Beautiful movement, where Chicago again became a prominent example because of the famous plan created by Daniel Burnham in 1909, again based on that, the white city of the World's Fair, was also, if we looked clo look closely, also about white flight from an increasingly diverse city. It's fascinating to see these maps, like the one in the middle, of the ethnic composition of Chicago neighborhoods that were created in the same year as Burnham's plan. And there's Burnham's plan with its wide avenues radiating out and in from the city, permitting rapid movement to and from the white suburbs that were also growing rapidly at the same time. I don't have time today to delve into the incredibly rich and interesting history of suburbs and their development in the United States. But if we fast forward from Riverside to the post-war era, when an enormous pent-up demand for housing existed, and at the same time the U.S. economy had, to become, had begun to depend as never before on new housing starts as fundamental to its health and vigor, we have to look at places like Levittown. Like Riverside, Levittown was designed at a distance from the urban core of Philadelphia, but within reach by car or commuter rail. It was designed to be picturesque, that is, to have curvilinear streets designed around public parks and green spaces, and with single-family houses embedded on their own privately landscaped lots. And like Riverside, which was located at a remove from Chicago with its overcrowded streets, its smells, its traffic and health hazards, and many immigrants, Levittown was designed to be a world apart from Philadelphia. Levittown, like most suburbs, is a complicated place. And people moved there, and I want to emphasize this, people moved there for all kinds of reasons, including simply the available availability of affordable homes at a time when that wasn't easy to come by, and all kinds of other practical concerns. But Levittown, like many other suburbs at the time, was designed exclusively and explicitly for whites. The mechanics of maintaining an all-white community were fairly simple. All sales for new homes were transacted through a single building on the site, which was called the House of Levittown. But elsewhere, and for decades afterwards, suburbs maintained their racial exclusivity with assistance from the, the FHA and its redlining practices. And we can talk about that in the Q&A if you all aren't familiar with that. But it basically meant that uh, federally insured mortgages would be determined by maps that were created by the FHA and they would literally draw red lines on the map around neighborhoods that had large concentrations of people of color and those would then be excluded from federally insured um, mortgages. So that was one practice. Um, there was also real estate staring, block busting, and similar tax tactics that made it very difficult for blacks and other people of color to access these homes. When a black family, Daisy and William Myers and their children, who you see here with, with a family guest, finally did, did move to Levittown in August of 1957, Protests and riots broke out that lasted for weeks with hundreds of people standing in front of the Myers' home and threats made to the family and to their sympathetic neighbors. So here you see images that were in the newspapers. This was actually an internationally um, publicized, uh, made the journals uh, in, in Europe as well. Um, it went on for many, many weeks. Um, people sometimes just stopping and staring at the house, people parading in front of it. 
but also um, acts of violence, um, rocks thrown through the family's picture window, KKK sprayed on the side of the house of their sympathetic neighbor, a, a cross burned on their neighbor's lawn, and so on. Now, if we look at these maps of res residential segregation that appeared in the Washington Post this past year, we see that Levittown's demographic makeup has changed little in the intervening years. Um, and you can see Levittown just way up there in the top corner, and there's Philadelphia right there. And uh, I think the map otherwise is pretty self-explanatory. So although some US cities and suburbs have seen considerable, de considerable demographic change, and, and I want to emphasize that, considerable demographic change. It depends on where in the country you're looking, but the story of suburban integration and also sometimes new forms of segregation is a fascinating one and a complex one. Yet residential segregation endures, often rigidly so, preventing social and economic mobility for people of color and setting the stage for future generations who will experience the deep inequalities that mark our landscape today. In other words, all of those life chances that I talked about at the beginning are not available to you if you cannot buy a home or if you cannot buy a home in a neighborhood where the valuing of that property will hold or increase over time and can be passed down through generations. Many years ago, I wrote an essay in which I described the ways designed verdant landscapes seduce, the ways they create an aesthetic veil that it can obscure harsher lived realities. I continue to be fascinated by this, by the ways that controlled and designed nature that part of the landscape naturalizes the circumstances of those who live within and around and outside, obscuring or making it difficult to see the structures that exclude, oppress, and deny. So what was beauty to William Levitt and to some of the residents of Levittown? Although it might seem superficially to have appeared to be that green Arcadia that we saw first in Riverside and a version of it replicated later in Levittown, it was actually not so green. It was actually white, all white. Thank you. Hello, everyone. How are you today? So nice to have you. Thank you so much for coming. I must just pause and almost grieve for a moment with our previous speakers, but thank you for speaking so boldly and truthfully. I always love being around historians because they bring such rich knowledge of things we need to understand to look at our present. And to make two connections to the previous speakers, my name is Danielle Wood and I own a Levitt home. <laughs> uh, so I was very, yeah, <laughs> I was very excited when I realized the connection and the chance to speak with our fellow speaker today. Uh, so between 2006 and until recently, my husband and I have had this home. Now my mom lives there, but still in our family. Uh, I could say we are uh, on the D.C. suburbs, right outside Maryland, uh, sorry, outside D.C. in the town of Bowie, Maryland. And although our county and our city are quite diverse, it's still very powerful for me to reflect and to learn from the history of these previous stories across the country in the Levitt system, because our neighborhood still bears some of the story and some of the uh, challenges of, of having a process of segregation and desegregation that we still are still working through, actually. So thank you for the work that helps me understand my home better. I will speak a bit more about my work, uh, and I hope in the Q&A we can talk about um, my hometown of Orlando, which also calls itself a city beautiful, and talk about my experience of my grandfather uh, as one of the first uh, black leaders to help create a lakeside property in which a, a series of black families came together to own and create uh, communities that were uh, not quite suburbs, they were quite close to the downtown area, but were uh, self-driven and self-defined neighborhoods. So I'll have to talk about that later on. For now, I'll jump ahead and speak about my work at MIT, where I serve as professor and also lead the Space Enabled Research Group. Our mission is that we are seeking to advance justice in Earth's complex systems using designs enabled by space. Now, I use the term justice quite consciously, and I use it in two particular ways. On one hand, for me, creating a more just world it means thinking about the fact that technology from space provides a number of key sources of infrastructure and public services. So a just world is one in which these services, supporting communication and transportation, understanding of things like the weather, these should be available to every human because they are a global level service. So we want to continue to work until everyone benefits equally, no matter where they are born, no matter where they live. 
Our second definition comes from a global dialogue. Hopefully you've heard, heard or been part of this dialogue. The United Nations has led the world to come together and define the 17 Sustainable Development Goals as part of an agenda toward 2030. How many of you follow the Sustainable Development Goals or have heard of them before? Good to see those hands. How many of you would say you use these in your daily work and somehow it's part of how you define your mission in life? Thank you. I, the, I actually want to challenge everyone because it's possible for every single person to find one of these goals and say, I'm working on that, because really it's quite broad. The 17 goals start with a level of basic human needs. Think about our systems and our city level systems, our global systems of trade, and go all the way up to the planetary scale of biodiversity and ensuring we maintain our oceans and life on land. But they also bring together really a highlight of the challenges we've created by making poor choices as a species, especially since the Industrial Revolution, but also through the era of what's known as exploration that led to colonialism, slavery, and uh, basically imperialism that has led to a series of levels of inequality, especially uh, for those of color around the world. So we are arguing that uh, meeting these goals is also helping to make the world more just. And my special flavor is that technology from space is the tool I would like to add to our global toolbox to effectively use these tools, which already exist, uh, to design them in a way that development practitioners and really all of us who are helping to meet these goals can use them effectively. There are currently six space technologies available that can help us reach the sustainable development goals. If you'd like to learn more, I have a TED Talk. It's available to Google search Danielle Wood and TED, and you'll find a deeper description of these six technologies. It includes satellite Earth observation, satellite positioning and navigation. Actually, human spaceflight also is a tool because through that, we do microgravity research, and we understand how the human body, plants, and animals, and other materials behave differently when the effect of gravity is not dominant. That knowledge helps us redesign things on Earth, including our health systems, uh, medicines, and other manufacturing. Satellite communication is important throughout the world, but especially during times of disaster or in areas that are remote from cities. Space technology transfer just means that often we find uh, clever engineering approaches to space designs, and those same designs can be brought back to other fields if we do it intentionally. And the last piece is research capacity. I'll show you a few examples, but I get so excited when I see research and fundamental scientific activity expanding to new countries, because that means they're increasing their ability to innovate and help solve their own problems. In my team, I bring together scholars and thinkers from six areas, because if you want to solve the sustainable development goals, we have to bring every kind of thinking, and I have a slice of that here with my team. It means we are designers, both from the engineering point of view, as well as from art and creative work, such as architecture. I have a fine artist who practices art, not just for solving problems, but really, for, really to celebrate what it means to be a human. We are social scientists. We read a lot of history, and we try to draw from the knowledge of anthropologists, sociologists, and others, and make sure we understand economics, because that's going to help us think about what problems we're trying to address. And we develop and build technical systems using tools from complex system engineering, satellite design, I'll show you some examples, and from data science, computer science, as well as geospatial visualization. All of this is an example of the kind of interdisciplinary thinking we need to reach the sustainable development goals. And our goal actually is to redesign space technologies so they're most useful to development leaders who come from these four levels of thinking. It includes multilateral organizations, national governments, regional and city level governments, and from those working in hyper-local le levels at universities, nonprofits, and companies. I'll give a few examples, because this really is how I connect to the cities, meaning people who are leaders in cities invite me to their cities to learn about them and to see how they are fighting for change and development. And if I can, I collaborate with them and help them use technology from space as part of their work. I want to give credit to my team, especially uh, the graduate students and research staff that are part of the team that really make the work happen. And you see, uh, we aim to be a diverse community, both in the ways we think and in our backgrounds and experiences. I'll give a few examples now of the cities that have invited me to join in their journey towards sustainable development goals. Pleasure to start with Rio. How many of you have been to Rio? It's a place where I need to go spend more time, but I was so honored to be invited, because of course, this is a city that geographically has so much richness. It's a place of water, of mountains, of forest, of urban beauty, and of favelas, and of great diversity, and of uh, a complex history. <laughs> and it's a place of Olympics and World Cup. There's a lot of stories there. And I was honored to be invited to speak at a city conference and meet the mayor, who you see in the foreground. But what I want to highlight in this picture is not the mayor, but the gentleman standing just over my shoulder, because he is a city geographer. And he's really the reason I was there. Uh, the city of Rio believes in data. If you're curious, you can go to a website called data.rio. 
you might need to practice a bit of Portuguese because it's labeled in Portuguese, but you know, maps are, are sort of beyond language, so you can use Google Translator. But there's a lot of open data being collected and operated by the geographers in the city, describing what's happening there and helping them plan how to operate their city more effectively. And my team and I are developing a research practice of coordinating with the city geography team as well as local researchers. And we're asking how we can help them understand local activities using uh, input we have from NASA scholars we collaborate with as well as from upcoming research on computer science. For example, one area we're looking at is the question of how mangroves, which are a very fragile ecosystem but very vital to health, can coexist with human communities despite the fact that there's some tension between human needs and the needs of the mangrove communities. So I'll highlight Rio as one place where we're there because they already love uh, the need to use data from satellites as part of their system of geographic analysis for the city, and we want to work with them as they are leaders in that area. I'll take you now across uh, the continent of South America over to Chile, to Santiago, and I was recently there hosted by the government and had the honor to speak at one of their annual conferences focusing on creating the future. And while it's of course a breathtaking city and a breathtaking country and with all the beauty of both uh, the major telescopes they have in the north and the links to Antarctica in the south, I was actually mostly there to meet a particular rebel. <laughs> he is a professor uh, and he is the first in the country to build a satellite locally at the university level. And I love meeting those who are, I know many of these heroes, who when people tell them, our country, we don't need to build satellites, we can just buy one. They say, no, our students need to learn to do this and we can start to better decide for ourselves how we want to use satellites for research, for services, as well as for innovation. And so he has a laboratory, he took us to the basement of, of this building in the engineering side at the University of Chile. And Professor Marcos Diaz is on uh, his second and third satellite projects and is figuring out uh, how to work through this process of international collaboration. I'll take you now around the globe. We're now in the country of Mauritius and the city of Port Louis. We're on a small island just off the east coast of Africa, and it's an area where the city and the island are not so different. Uh, of course, there are areas outside the major city, but really the city is the heart of the small island. And I was also there to meet with scientists and engineers. You see here a number of the professors and students who joined me for a discussion that day from the University of Mauritius. And this is another country that's pursuing their first satellite project. It will soon uh, be launched uh, from the International Space Station in partnership with the United Nations. And you might ask yourself, why is a small island country pursuing a satellite project? And they're thinking deeply about the long-term strategy they're going to pursue. But the reason they're involved is they already have a great history of being leaders in the region of Southern Hemisphere radio astronomy. Their island's been a site for a very special telescope in partnership with India, where they studied a view of the sky you can't see from the north to have a part of our understanding of what comes, the light that comes in the radio part of the spectrum. Uh, they also understand that as sea level comes and rises affecting their island, as cyclones pass through, as one did while I was visiting there, they need to use data from satellites and positioning information and communication systems to prepare to respond uh, to major impacts of disasters and to daily life. They're also building a new metro system in the city and, and data from satellites can help them plan and understand the impacts. So even a small country like Mauritius, which is an island and, and really a city country, uh, needs to use technology from space uh, to ensure their survival in a cl changing climate. I'll take you now for a final stop in Cotonou in West Africa, we're in Benin. And here you have an aerial view of a city that exists on a small sliver of land between a major lake and the ocean. And it was my pleasure to be invited there, both to see the urban area you see now and also to see a beautiful city or community on this major lake called Nokwe. Here you see a tradition where for hundreds of years people have lived in these homes on the water. And earlier, they were gathered there during the time of the slave trade because it was a place in marshy land where people could run and away and escape and competing and escape those who were trying to capture them uh, as slave traders. It was a community that originally would have been a mix of different ethnicities, but now over time they've developed their own language and community and way of life built largely on living on the water. But you can see literally on the intersection between the water and the land. This area is, hardly, is strongly affected by an invasive plant species called the water hyacinth, which really does not belong there, but has come from the American hemisphere. And this uh, entrepreneur named Dr. Fola Muftau invited me to visit Benin to learn about his company's work to harvest this invasive plant and convert it into products that are used to absorb and to recover from oil-based waste. So they're taking a dangerous product, which is the invasive plant, removing it from the environment, which improves environmental health, but they're also using the invasive product as something that can actually remediate a different problem, which is industrial pollution due to oil waste. 
you see us here on a boat. We're both learning about the plant's growth, but also uh, doing water testing. Uh, my team is building low-cost sensors to measure the temperature and salt level, and also um, understanding how the chemistry of the water influences the growth of the plant. This will allow this team, this company, to better understand and plan their operations and their harvesting. We're also helping them set up a website that will have data from satellites and from airborne sensors to better understand what's happening in their region or any region in the world where they hope to expand their work. So we are seeing the connection between uh, technology from space and the local aspirations of development leaders like Dr. Muftau and like these scientists who are right there in the city of Cotonou and who are from the National Institute of Water and have deep expertise about the water chemistry and hydrology. Uh, they have a vision for improving their city and their region and our goal is to ask what are the barriers that make it difficult for them to use technology from space? And how can we reduce those barriers through better interdisciplinary design? I'll transition briefly just to point out, we can also ask what's happening in the future and where will new technologies from space take us, both for sustainability on Earth, but also in new communities beyond the Earth. I'll highlight the changes you're seeing in the space community. This is a traditional NASA-built satellite. I'm a proud alum of NASA as an employee there previously, and I love NASA satellites. This is one the size of a vehicle. You can see it's almost bigger than a, a car, and it's going to operate in space as a weather satellite for years to come. It's something very prestigious and built very carefully with, it's quite expensive as well. In contrast, we're also seeing different styles of satellites being built, uh, like this model of young girls working on what, what we call a CubeSat, which is an example of a small satellite that won't last long and won't do lots of things. It'll do one thing usually, and it will last for a few months in space, but it can be built by kids because the parts are more customized and the parts are available, you can actually order them online. You too could, could build your own CubeSat with a little help. So we're seeing people around the world adopting this, what we call small satellite technology. And that's why countries like Mauritius and Chile are getting involved. So I have colleagues in Venezuela, colleagues from Sudan, from Nigeria. From every corner of the earth, if you hear people saying, this country has a new satellite, believe it because it's happening everywhere. In Ghana and South Africa, there are space programs, both for research and for social applications. So a lot of my honor is to spend time with the people who are creating these and making it possible. We're also seeing new companies, like this one called Planet. A colleague of mine named Robbie Shingler and his colleague uh, Will Marshall, they started this company that now uses a series, about 200 satellites that are small in this CubeSat style, and they take an image of everywhere on Earth every day, giving us new levels of, of knowledge about what's happening and changing in our environment. Meanwhile, a number of companies are helping to create the vehicles that will help us create a marketplace, first around the Earth, perhaps later on the moon, maybe on asteroids, also um, eventually on Mars. Many of the leaders of these companies would have said publicly they would like to create communities on Mars. Now, I love space and I'm inspired by this, but I also want to highlight that as companies like Blue Origin and SpaceX develop new technologies that are inspiring, I encourage us to pause and think deeply. We just reflected on the sustainable development goals. We have them because we made, as a species, some grave errors. We've created a community and a system of consumption and unsustainable production. We use our natural resources under the ground and in the atmosphere too quickly. And if we do the same thing in space, we'll quickly harm and ruin, uh, we could say Mars, perhaps asteroids, perhaps the moon, so that future generations will not be able to enjoy them as we are. So my invitation now is even as we celebrate exciting new technology achievements of companies like these and of, the, of NASA as they develop new technology, let's also call for a pause and for reflection on how we can create sustainable development goals for life beyond Earth while continuing to be very careful and cautious as we take care of our own planet. May our inspiration about the future of space also inspire us to care for our planet and to think about designing better societies both on Earth and beyond. So my team at the Media Lab in Boston I'm, I have the privilege of working at this beautiful small city, you could say, which is full of professors and students and researchers who gather together in a very kind of visually transparent community. We're trying to grapple with these hard problems. We don't do it alone. We do it in partnership with leaders uh, from many cities around the world who are helping reach sustainable development goals right where they are. So thank you. Hello, how's everyone doing? All right, I'm doing well, thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you for that. It's very informative, both of you, and I feel like all of us have a lot of research to do when we go home. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Nolan Ryan Tro. I'm coming at the beautiful city from strictly a visual standpoint. Um, I'm a documentary photographer. 
Um, I'm 26 years old. Uh, for the first 23 years of my life, I was able-bodied. So I never really had to think about accessibility when I was living. I never had to think about, you know, how am I going to get to this building? How am I going to get from my house to work or school? Or how am I going to go to a restaurant? There are very simple things that maybe a lot of you haven't had to think about, or maybe you have. Um, but for me, as a young man, it was just something that never crossed my mind. So I moved to New York um, two years ago to pursue a MA in sociology and human rights and journalism. It's a multidisciplinary degree. Um, I've mostly focused on human rights, however. And when I moved there, I met this man. His name's Alex. And I met him at a wheelchair basketball tournament. And I had to do a midterm assignment for my photojournalism course. So at first, I was thinking, all right, I'm going to do something about wheelchair basketball. Um, but very shortly after I met him, I realized that his story was not so much about basketball. So this is Alex, and he's going down backwards uh, about four flights of stairs. This is 14th Street and 8th Avenue, for those of you who are familiar with New York City. Um, this is one of the bigger stations. He's already, uh, he's paraplegic. He became paraplegic after he was in a car accident about three years ago, similar to when I became injured. So in this, in this photo, we had just got to the station and we were on our way home late night. And it said that the elevator was working, but we got there and it was not. However, it was very late and we had to go. So he took the risk to go down the stairs backwards and risk further injury, perhaps breaking another vertebrae or maybe even dying, perhaps. So, you know, when, when you become disabled, when you become paraplegic or you're in a wheelchair and you have to think about accessibility, it, it really makes you feel alone in a lot of ways because you realize that society wasn't really built for you. It wasn't made for you. So a lot of times, you can end up feeling very alone, very isolated, very ostracized, as the disabled community is in society for the most part. Luckily, there are vehicles that are accessible, like this Braun Ability van. Unfortunately, though, um, they're very expensive. So unless you can afford the monthly payments, which can be upwards of three to $400 a month, um, if you don't make those payments, this car, like Alex's, was repossessed. So instead of being able to drive to where he needed to go, you know, find accessible areas, this car was repossessed and he was no longer able to use it. There are other methods of transportation, other cars you can use, but this is probably the most easy, most accessible way to go, and it's a very expensive option. So not only do we need to think about how cities are rebuilt, we need to think about the modes of transportation that we use when we're going to these cities. This is Alex playing basketball, because that's his main sport. And even when you think about sports and how they're played and who's watching and how even this, this court is designed, I mean, it's, it's not very high tech at all. It's, there's not a lot of places for people with disabilities to go to play sports unless you have a whole gym rented out. So a lot of times you're left to play in someone's backyard. Also thinking about accessibility and how future cities are built, we got to think about accessibility to healthcare and access to being healthy. Because if you're not healthy, you can't move about a city anyhow. So when you're paraplegic, when you're disabled, when you have a disease, you're more likely to be in the hospital more, which is more likely to give you higher bills, higher cost of living. And because people with disabilities are often discriminated against in the job sector, it's harder for these people to get out of poverty to pay these bills. So Alex, for instance, has been denied a lot of health care. A lot of his claims have been denied. Um, so yeah, when we're thinking about accessibility in cities, we need to think about the institutions in the cities as well. This, this picture is from uh, my first story I published in the New York Times. It's about this man, Adi Ambo, and that's his son, Ali. 
Adiambo lost both of his legs in a car accident uh, 10 years ago. And so when I met him, we had a lot in common and he told me, you know, I want to create my own pair of prosthetics because the ones that I have are too heavy and they're very expensive and I don't have access to them. So immediately I wanted to do a story about him. This is Adiambo pushing up a flight of stairs in Brooklyn. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of the housing in New York is inaccessible, including public housing, which a lot of disabled people live in because over 67% of disabled people live in poverty. So a lot of disabled people live in inaccessible housing because houses with elevators or housing in New York with elevators is more expensive. It's, you know, like these are nicer buildings and there is a law that says 7% of of rooms have to be allocated to people with disabilities, but it's a lot of work to find those places, and if they're already filled, then that law is not into effect. So we have to think about rebuilding the infrastructure. This was in a, a West Harlem uh, public housing, the Grant Houses, and he was on his way to meet a friend, but the elevator, there's only two elevators in the whole building. And you have to think, the building is 16 floors tall and about 12 units on each building. So that's a lot of people <laughs> for one elevator. Um, so we ended up waiting in this lobby for probably 20 to 30 minutes just so we could get to the fourth floor where um, you know, his friend lives. And yeah, without this elevator, you gotta think too, like what happens if a fire, what happens if a fire happens, right? Um, and people with disabilities are not on the, on the ground floor because there's only three or four units on the ground floor. So what, so what happens to these people? They're probably going to die because they're not, <laughs> they're not gonna be able to crawl down 16, 13, 14 flights of stairs before you know, smoke inhalation will get the best of them. This is him going to school. And as you can see, it's raining and there are curb cuts, right? but you can also see these large puddles. You can also see when you have to use two hands to use a wheelchair, you can't use an umbrella. So it doesn't matter if you use waterproof gloves or if you have a waterproof coat. If you have to go through these large puddles, your hands you're, you're, are gonna be soaked within a matter of minutes and when it's very cold, you know, this can lead to health problems. And sometimes the curb cuts aren't even there. So if a, a sidewalk is too tall, there's no way you can get up it really anyway unless you have someone help you. This is him at school the same day. Um, we could talk about access to education for disabled people, but that's a whole different conversation. We could do a whole talk about that. Um, this is other small things that we don't think about. It's not just, like I said, it's the city that has to be beautiful and accessible, but what about the grocery store? Um, you know, when you're shopping, um, you know, if you have your basket, and you can walk, you can squeeze by, you can go through aisles, but when you're in a chair, there's no squeezing by, you know, you have to, every single time you wanna get by someone, you have to say, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And you know, by like the 50th time you ask someone, can you move it? You know, it's not a great feeling to always have to ask people to move. And thankfully, you know, I was there with his two sons and they have this automatic cart that they were using, but you know, I've been to the store with him before and when you have to use both hands to move around, there's no real good way to grocery shop because you have to end up stacking pretty much all the groceries on your lap and you have to hope they don't fall over. So we have to think about accessibility and beauty even in stores. And this is him and his son on his birthday. I just wanted to include that. So that leads me to my most recent piece which was published in the New York Times on Thanksgiving weekend which was called revelations in a wheelchair. So since my injury, um, I at first couldn't walk and I was labeled complete, meaning that they said I had no function of my legs. About a month after that, I started to regain some function in my legs. And a year later, I was walking. Um, so I didn't really have to use my wheelchair all that much when I first moved to New York. But because I can't feel my feet, in August of last year, I had a severe pressure ulcer on my right foot which basically ripped off the skin 
to the bottom of my bone. And my doctor told me, you know, you can't walk on this for two to three months. Luckily, I have my wheelchair. But it didn't help when the subway station by my house, which was has an elevator, the, the elevator was broken for over a month, and I still had to go places. And when, you know, an Uber or a Lyft ride is 60 or $70 to go from Brooklyn to Manhattan, that, that gets pretty expensive. Um, so, yeah, and, you know, you try to get on a subway, but, you know, it's, it's rush hour, and people have places to go, right? So, you know, they don't care to really make room for you most of the times. I think in the, at, this, at this station, I think I had to wait for three trains or so to maybe get on before I could fit on because everyone sort of, you know how it is in New York, if you've been to New York or pretty much any metropolitan area, everyone kind of swarms for it. And when you're in a wheelchair, you can't, you can't do it. So you kind of get the short end of the stick on that one. So we have to think about transportation also, not just access to it, but the, the actual train itself. Um, simple things like getting a coffee, you know, I, I love this place, I get my coffee here all the time. But there's a really large step to get in, and so they have this bell you have to ring, and you ring the bell, and you wait a couple minutes, and then someone comes and they say, oh, you know, I'm in the middle of making a drink, hold on. You wait five more minutes, finally they get this. and. So something as simple as, you know, something that took, can take me now when I'm walking, like literally two seconds to open a door and get in is now a 10 to 15 minute process on the way in and on the way out. So yeah, we have to think about accessibility and all, all facets of society. Um, yeah, this is me waiting at the bottom of the stairs when an elevator was out and, you know, people just kind of pass you by or they glare at you. And that was other, another thing I've noticed. You know, it's, there's never really a normalized space when you're disabled in society. It's like people sort of either stare at you or try not to stare at you, and I'm not sure which one is more offensive, but um, <laughs> apparently this guy. <laughs> but it, it's funny, because when you are in a wheelchair and you're taking pictures of people, it's. it's I think people are very confused by it because they're like, wait, shouldn't you be asking me for a dollar or, you know what I mean? Like a lot of people I noticed when I was in a wheelchair like automatically thought I was homeless for some reason. So I would go up to someone and try to ask them, hey, what time is it? Before I could even say anything, I'd say, hey, excuse me. And they're walking away, oh, we don't have money. We don't have money. It's like, so, you know, you gotta not just change the beauty of the actual physical society, but you gotta make people understand that people with disabilities are still people and we are still beautiful too. Uh, yeah, just another, you know, that's where the subway is. So you don't wanna get hit by that. And then someone's walking and then there's vomit and probably urine or maybe fluid from the vomit. So when you're in a wheelchair, you have to understand your wheels go through that. And then that gets on your hands, so. <laughs> Yeah, we gotta really uh, rethink the way that society has been designed. And it's not really, it's not surprising that society is so inaccessible because, you know, since the dawn of time, since the Roman Empire, disabled children or children who were born with deformities were discarded. Um, you know, they were actually left in clay pots by their parents to die because they thought putting them in the pot would rid them of any agency in that murder. So if you think thousands and thousands of years of society is being built without a whole group of people in mind, um, disabled people or people with ambulatory disabilities or mental uh, cognitive disabilities, you know what I mean? So it's not surprising that society has been made so inaccessible, but, and I don't wanna discount all the progress that has been made with the ADA and you know all the veterans who came back from Vietnam and World War II and Iraq and all the people who have made large progress in making the world more accessible. But the reality is, is there is still a very long way to go. And I'm hopeful that it's gonna get there. And you know, so my job is to just bring these kind of things to light. Thank you. Thank you.